Hello and welcome into another episode of Lockdown Wolves. Today on the show, preview in Game 2 between the Wolves and Mavs in the Western Conference Finals. What adjustments could we expect from the Wolves, specifically related to their pick-and-roll defense and also what they need to fix offensively to have a, a to, to lead Minnesota with a split and uh, head to Dallas with a little bit of momentum for Game 3 on Sunday. It's all coming to the show. Welcome in. You are Lockdown Wolves. You are Locked On Timberwolves, your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Wolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Beacon. I'm the host of Locked On Wolves. Today's episode is brought to us by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster post your job for free at linkedin.com slash lockdown nba that's linkedin.com slash lockdown nba to post your job for free terms and conditions apply happy friday everybody happy weekend and happy game two of the western conference finals tonight at target center once again a 7 30 central tip today is all about what to expect in game two i'll give my take on both sides of the ball we'll also make a prediction here at the end and also predict sunday's game because why not uh that's that's uh we're just over 48 hours away from that, too, since we're on this every other day uh, pace here for the conference finals. Uh, so lots to get to today. Big thank you off the top for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere. That includes YouTube as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. Wherever you like to listen to podcasts, you can find Lockdown Wolves. You can also watch on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app on both Roku and Amazon at Fire TV. And you can follow on X at Lockdown T Wolves and also at B Beacon. With two B's, two E's, C K E N. A reminder: if you can't watch the game live tonight, you can catch it on the Sirius XM SXM app. Just search Minnesota Timberwolves. You can hear the home stand broadcast with our friend Alan Horton. Again, the SXM app. Search Minnesota Timberwolves. You'll find the game. Also, Jim Peterson, color commentator in the playoffs, really good. Uh, if you can't watch it, and after the game, of course, we do the live postcast over at Lockdown Sports Minnesota on YouTube. I pinched hit as the guest uh, at, as the guest after game one. Tonight, I believe we'll have Tyler Metcalf back as the guest with Luke Inman hosting the show tonight following the game. Again, Lockdown Sports Minnesota on YouTube. We'll have the audio here on Lockdown Wolves if you can't catch it live on YouTube. All right, let's go ahead and get into this. So I mentioned some of this in passing in, on the uh, the post-game pod, which would have been yesterday's show following Wednesday night's game one. And um, I didn't get a chance to get super deep into it because there was a lot to react to in terms of crunch time, uh, some of the other you know, failings of the Wolves and, and things that went well that were just more of a quick reaction sort of thing. Now I want to get a little bit more in depth. And after re-watching parts of the game, and Chris Finch, of course, had his uh, – his, um, impassioned media availability on Thursday where he talked about the uh, the film session. Uh, he was described by many media members as feisty. He uh, had a quote, I'm paraphrasing, and I'm sure you've seen it at this point, but, you know, the Western Conference Finals started, not sure if they got that memo, but they, they know now after this afternoon. Um, I, like, rewatching confirmed some suspicions of, not suspicions, confirmed uh, I guess what I thought that there was a little bit of lackadaisicalness, if you will, which is jarring in game one of the conference finals. But again, the game seven hangover is a real thing. And, and Sam and I talked about this on the postcast. I referenced it on Thursday. And I know people in the comments were like, you know, you can't make excuses, et cetera. Well, yeah, it's not an excuse. It's a reality. Uh, it, it doesn't make it okay. I'm not saying it's fine that they lost because of the game seven hangover. It's just a fact that it exists. So that certainly plays into it at the same time. That was the case, but the actual execution, like, I, it wasn't as sharp, obviously, as game six and seven against Denver. It wasn't as sharp as games one and two against Denver, but it was certainly better than a couple of those losses to Denver, uh, certainly better than the start of a couple of those games, uh, like game seven against Denver. I, like, defensively, and I know I said this by, was, this is my initial reaction, but rewatching some of this backed it up. I actually don't think the pick and roll defense against Luka Doncic was all that bad. I think they did a good job of mixing what they were doing, but I think they should mix it more. What I mean by that is Gobert was usually dropping on the side of the floor. We saw him blitz a couple of times. He was at the level 
um, there was one play that was making the rounds on on Twitter where he did trap on the left side of the floor, and then Ant helps the roller uh, for the backside and gets a poke away. The Wolves get a steal fast break the other way. That did happen a couple of times, and I think the reason that works is if you mix up the coverages. Um, it did seem to be more on the sides of the floor they were doing that. In the middle of the floor, they were still at a drop. Um, and I think this, this is what I, I believe makes sense is the reason for that would be if you blitz in the middle of the floor, you you don't have the side of the floor to trap him against, and then he can pass to either corner, and you're just playing a guessing game and hoping he doesn't pick wherever your help is coming from. Um, if, if you're trying to trap or, or at least trying to – you're not really trapping in the middle of the floor. If you're trying to blitz him or play at the level of the screen, it becomes more challenging. And I think the calculation was this allows us to switch it up, and it'll at least take him a minute to figure out in what situation we're trapping and what situation are we dropping. And also, Gobert is the best in the league at drop coverage because he's so long and he has such good feel. It's not like, you know, drop is such a – playing drop pick and roll coverage is such a dirty term for Tim Rules fans because we've watched Carl Anthony Towns attempt to do it in David Vanterpool's scheme under Ryan Saunders several years ago, and Cat never had the feel. Nas Reed back then never had the feel. They just didn't – they didn't execute it well. And then Finch came in, and, and basically the first year and a half they're running – a, a blitzing scheme with Cat out on the perimeter using his strength, strength, length, aggressiveness uh, in those situations. And that worked well. And it was also because the team was undersized with Jared Vanderbilt at the four. And um, that worked well. Now with Rudy, Rudy's a massive human and he's one of the best shot blockers in the league and one of the very best, if not the best at drop because of his feel, because of his length, because of his ability to help and recover. So the idea is even though Luca is one of the best at attacking drop, Rudy's one of the best one of the best at defending drop. Strength versus strength, and then if we add in some other coverages, like if Cat's involved, we're going to play at the level. If it's on the side of the floor, we're going to try and blitz and trap him. I think that's the right strategy. It still took Luca twenty three shots to get excuse me twenty six shots to get thirty three points, and he turned it over four times. Sure, you, you don't want him to score thirty plus, but that's going to happen. I mean, it's it's not. Could they have done a little bit of a better job? Yeah, but I think it's more execution than it was scheme. I don't necessarily – I didn't necessarily hate the scheme. In the games they that they lost the Thunder, it is true, though. Lucas scored sub-20. In game their game one loss to the Thunder, Luka had 19 points and 19 shots. And he had five turnovers. In the game four loss to the Thunder, he had 18 points on 20 shots and seven turnovers. So – when Luca plays well, the Mavs have won so far in the playoffs. You can go farther back to the Clippers series. It wasn't quite as drastic. They lost game one of that series. He had 33, but it took him 66 shots to – or excuse me, 66. 26 shots to get there. 66 would be something. Half a, <laughs> It would be a, a half point per shot attempt, uh, points per possession, um, or point per shot. And then in their other loss, the Clippers, he had 29 on 24 shots. So, it, again, the volume's always going to be there. He's only attempted – Less than 20 shots three times in uh, how many games they played so far? In 12 playoff games, 13 playoff games. So he's going to get his shots and he's going to score. They just have to be a little bit – so this is my adjustment, I guess. Mix it up a little bit more. Like however you want to – however they're going to manage that play call, I think Rudy could play up a little bit more in the middle of the floor. And, and it is a pick-your-poison situation, but it's not like the Mavs were flamethrowers – I said this on the show. They were due for some regression to the mean from some of those other shooters, from P.J. Washington, Derek Jones Jr. These guys aren't 40% three-point shooters. Now, they're not 20% either, which is basically what those guys were in this in game one. But it's somewhere in the middle, and you can pick your poison a little bit. Luka's going to hit that floater, what, 70% of the time? Or that little jumper in the lane if you're softly contesting it? I would rather roll the dice on occasionally forcing P.J. Washington or Derek Jones Jr., or Josh Green into a semi-contested corner three at a 35% clip. I mean, the math is similar there, right? Um, so I think you mix up coverages a little bit more, and I think Rudy has to play a little bit closer to touch in the drop. I don't think he can drop quite as far. You still got the lob to contend with, but um, and if Cat's out out on the you know guarding somebody near the perimeter, you don't have him necessarily as your low man help. So it again, pick your poison. But I think that's where mixing coverages plays into it. And the Wolves' length should give them a fighting chance no matter what. So I think it's it's playing at the level a little bit more in the middle of the floor. I think it's Rudy playing closer to touch on the drop instead of sagging so far to try and prevent the lob. And uh, it's just crisper rotations on the back end, which again, I don't think they were that bad. I think it was okay. 
Luca was just great. Kyrie was great. Um, I also think they should try Ant on Luca a little bit more. And I know Ant was exhausted last game, but it almost feels like rather than chasing Kyrie around, taking the physicality of Luca and just in a bruising matchup might actually be better for Ant fatigue wise. It just seems like that Ant may handle that better than the cardio workout of just chasing Kyrie around the floor and then having to try go score on the go and try score on the go and try to score on the other end. Um, so I wonder if they try Ant. Ant guarded Luca really well in the regular season um, the last couple of years. Really, if you go back and watch, he did a pretty good job when he was he was one on one against him. So those are my three uh, defensive tweaks: mixing up coverages a little bit more, not dropping quite as far on Luca pick and rolls. And never dropping with Cap, by the way. And, and I don't know that they really did ever in game one either. I think he was mostly playing up uh, at the level. And then uh, try Ant on Luca. Just mix it up a little bit. Not all the time. I think switching those matchups makes a ton of sense to keep guys fresh and also to give Dallas different looks and try and complicate things for them. Um, so those are my three defensive adjustments. I want to talk about the other side of the ball, and then we'll close the show with making a prediction here uh, on the show today. Today's episode of Locked Out Wolves is brought to us by our presenting sponsors, LinkedIn. When you're hired for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. They have a vast network of more than a billion, a billion with a B, professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. LinkedIn does all that while making the process easy and intuitive. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing a ton of hats and might not have the time or resources to hire. So they're constantly finding ways to make the process easier. They even just launched a feature that helps you write job descriptions, making the process easier and quicker. Two and a half million businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash lockdown NBA. That's linkedin.com slash lockdown NBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Do you watch Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day long? If so, no doubt you have to turn down the volume because of all the shouting. Instead, make the switch to Lockdown Sports today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel program for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Lockdown Sports Today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, let's talk about offense. So that was the bigger issue in this game. The defense got the attention in part because of Stan Van Gundy just lighting them up for playing drop every time down the floor, which they weren't. But every time they did, he he lambasted them for it. And, you know, I get it to an extent. But, again, you can live with it because you have to. Like, Luka's going to score some baskets. It's pick your poison. Uh, we covered that already. But on offense, um, it was it was not pretty for Minnesota. And, and of course, we saw this frequently in the regular season. Um, there were some good possessions early. And of course, Jaden McDaniels was great. The only thing other than that, that was positive was, well, first of all, the three point volume was crazy. They attempted almost twice as many threes as Dallas. I saw a stat floating around. I can't remember who it's from. I feel bad. I, I don't, I can't credit it. I also don't remember the exact stat, but it was something like going back 20 plus years, teams that shot, uh, you know, more than 20 threes, more than their opponent and turned the ball over less, uh, were like some crazy like, I don't know, 10 and 0 or 12 and 4 or something crazy like that. They shot 24 more threes than Dallas. They made 12 more threes. They had a 36 point advantage outside the arc. But they couldn't score in the paint. They didn't make free throws. They were minus five in terms of points at the free throw line because they were 61% shooting from the line. And their transition defense was really bad. But offensively, most of those threes were actually not terrible looks there were a couple forced from Nikhil um there was a Kyle Anderson above the break that you don't want there was maybe one or two forced from Mike Conley and forced one or two there was a little bit of desperation late from Cat. uh but like of those 49 I'd say like close to 40 of them weren't bad looks I don't 
And I know that like we could rip on the volume, and that's only because the uh, the rim attempts went down. If if there were like, I'm never going to be mad with them shooting nearly 40, 50 three pointers in a game. The problem was they didn't put any pressure on the rim because they were scared, I guess, by Daniel Gafford and Derek Lively, and there just was a lack of ball movement, a lack of. Um, early in the game, they were more aggressive loading up on Ant, and they went away from that. They started switching it more often, and I think they realized, hey, Ant's exhausted. He's happy to just launch threes. And he, like, he was 5 of 12. That's not bad. It's over 40%. Like, we'll take 5 of 12 for three. The problem is he had two rim attempts. We talked about this on the show the other day. He was 1 of 4 on two-point attempts. And his only make was that, like, elbow jumper. I think it was the Wolves' first basket of the game. Besides that, he had one other miss from around that same area. It was it was near the uh, basically near the, the the nail or the elbow, somewhere around the free throw line, and uh, he had two misses at the rim, and at least one of those he should have gotten a foul call on. Um, he only attempted two free throws. That was the biggest issue, and it was a function of not being willing to willing to attach, not being willing to attack the seams that Dallas was giving them, which is weird. Um, the other thing is when Ant was in isolation or when he, you know, rejected a screen or, or whatever, there was no off ball movement for Minnesota. And it's always a little bit of a tricky proposition because you don't want to mess up the spacing. But if everybody's completely stagnant, it allows Dallas to give the appearance of playing him one on one, but bring help very easily. And the late help makes it hard for Ant to throw a late pass. He's not Luka as a passer. He's just not. He's not Jokic. He's not going to throw that late lob. And the Wolves don't always have somebody coming from the opposite corner that's going to catch or the dunker that's going to catch that late lob because usually Cat's spaced for a three-pointer and nobody's crashing from the other side because they're worried about messing up spacing. Unless it's Rudy, and we've seen that Ant and Rudy lob improve over the course of the season, but we haven't seen it very much in the playoffs. Um, now, for the most part, uh, again, I like Ant's decision-making when he actually does make a pass was good. Again, eight assists to three turnovers. I thought early in the game, especially – he did a really good job at um, at making the right decisions there. He had that one left-handed like zip pass from from the uh, the it was like just to the left of the top of the floor to um, I don't remember who it was in the corner who missed the shot, but it was a really really good pass. Um, I thought that he had a couple good skip. Ant had a couple good skip passes uh, in this game when he you know he saw an opportunity to attack. And then threw the Mavs in rotation. But again, this was like the Wolves not making open shots a lot of the time. Like he would he would drive a seam, kick it to the opposite side, and they'd swing it, and Nikhil Alexander Walker would miss the three or whatever. Um, so the process was similar to the defense. It was close. The execution just wasn't quite there. And this goes back to what Chris Finch was so upset about, is they just weren't as sharp. Um, I like to me, and, and Chris Finch knows his team better than I do. And Chris Finch knows those guys and their mentalities and the way that they react to stuff. It did not strike me as just a straight or poor effort. It was a disappointing lack of focus for a game one of a conference final. Absolutely. And the execution was a little bit sloppy. Absolutely. Especially in the final two minutes. And I I ripped on their execution and the Jaden turnover and the Conley turnover and the Conley not following Derek Jones Jr. Like all that stuff we talked about. Uh, on yesterday's show. They've certainly played worse. I mean, like, this was not their worst game of the playoffs. If it's the worst game of this series that they play, they're going to win the series. They lost by a bucket. They lost by three points. Had a chance with 1.7 seconds left if Conley makes a free throw to intentionally miss, get a put back, and send it to overtime. In a game that Chris Fitch was living about, the way that they performed. Offensively, the execution was not awful. It was just a little bit surface level. It was just a little bit, let's hang on the perimeter. It was a little bit, uh, let's not get all the way to the rim because we're worried about Derek Lively. Um, that can't happen. They just need to be a little more aggressive. They need to be a little bit more willing to take that contact, to draw a foul, uh, to get a little deeper, to get that to before they kick the ball, to make sure that that three-pointer is a little bit more open, and then it's making the open threes. And I know for the game they shot, what, 37? Yeah, 36.7%. But Nikhil being 0 for 4 and Cap being 2 for 9, that's an anomaly. Conley being 1 for 6, I get it. So is Jaden 6 of 9. But, like, that's your only outliers, right? So that's going to balance out. You're still going to shoot 37% from 3 because that's what this team did anyway in the regular season. They were a top 3 three-point shooting team. So um, 
well, you may not have Jaden going six of nine. You're not going to have Nikhil and Mike Conley combined to go one for 10, especially because Nikhil's now missed his last nine or 10 threes in a row. So some of that's going to bounce back. The process was like 85% of the way there on both ends of the floor. The strategy was basically there on both ends of the floor. It was a little bit of the execution, just, just fine tuning that a bit. And then some of the, the bigger things, there's a couple other like uh, smaller things that were big because they were so bad at them that I want to hit next. We'll talk rebounding, transition defense, et cetera. And then I'll make a prediction here at the end of the show. Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is brought to us by our friends at eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. All right, real quick, a couple of bigger picture type things that the Wolves just failed at in this game. Rebounding is an obvious one. Uh, they were a minus eight on the glass. They gave up 11 offensive rebounds to, to Dallas. And there were a couple of plays, especially late, where, again, not an excuse, a reality, something that doesn't make it okay, but we have to factor this into the analysis. Fatigue clearly set in. Um, it looked a lot like Denver at the end of game seven, where there just weren't, like, remember the KCP mixed box out on the cat slam that basically ended the game, the the tip slam? Um, there were a couple of those where the Wolves just didn't put it, like, nobody put a body on anybody legitimately for the Wolves. And uh, it led to second chance opportunities for Dallas. I would also say transition defense. I know Dallas only had nine fast break points. The Wolves had 12, but there were a couple of them that were pretty bad. Running after makes. Um, there were a couple of those where the Wolves had a make and they just didn't get back. And that was, again, lack of focus slash fatigue, whatever you want to call it, whatever Chris Finch was surely upset about in the film room. There was a little bit of that. And I know, again, just nine fast break points. It felt like more than that. And I think there were some that were just kind of secondary break opportunities that didn't technically fall into transition points. But there just wasn't enough attention to detail uh, for the Wolves that they needed to clean up. Of course, points in the paint. We talked about the plus minus the other day. This is a case where uh, plus minus is interesting because it tells you, like, you just glance at this and most everybody on the Wolves was within a plus or minus five except for two players. Rudy was a plus 10. Nas was a minus 11. Nas was great for a stretch in the fourth quarter offensively. And it had a couple of nice defensive plays in there too. He had the contest on a, on a fast break dunk attempt, got all the sprinted back to the other end, just a straight, like a guard, a, like a movement shooter gets to the corner, knocks down a three in front of the Dallas bench. Like there were a couple of really nice stretches like that for Nas, but go back to the first half and Rudy comes off the floor. And I think Dallas had five or six straight buckets in the paint going back and watching that. And and we talked about this in the immediate aftermath on the post-game podcast, the postcast, um, the rim protection being non-existent when Rudy wasn't in the game. It wasn't great when he was in the game either. Remember, Dallas had 62 points in the paint in this game. The Wolves just had 38. So it's not all on Nas. It's also on Rudy. He's got to be better. This was not Rudy's best game. It wasn't the first half of game seven. It certainly wasn't as good as game as second half of game seven. It was somewhere in the middle. But they need a better version of Rudy against a potent offense like Dallas with players like Kyrie and Luka on the team. Um, and also ath athleticism and bounciness from their bigs, from Lively, from Gafford. Um, I mean, those are the primary two uh, that, you, that you really have to concern yourself with. Derek Jones Jr.'s activity, at least. Uh, P.J. Washington and, and his athleticism. P.J. Washington doing P.J. Washington things, giving you enough size to, to make things a bit more difficult, but also you're mostly worried about him stretching the floor. And then eventually if Maxi Kleba comes back and plays, which might happen mid-series, that brings a whole other element to this series. So Rudy's got to be a little bit better. Nas has to be a lot better defensively. They can't have a gap of, of uh, you know, 20 points when Rudy's off the floor. And that's what this was. So uh, some adjustments there for sure. And again, 
I don't think it's scheme. I think it's just playing better. Sometimes that's what it is. It's a combination of the other team being really good and you struggling with your execution. And that's that was the margin in a three-point game. We're not talking about a 15, 20 point blowout where massive adjustments are needed. This was a close game where they didn't execute down the stretch. And there were some sloppy elements along the way that contributed to a late deficit. All right. Here's what I think is going to happen on uh, tonight, on Friday night game two. I think the Wolves win. I said that on Wednesday's show when I predicted the series. I said they would lose game one. I thought there'd be something in a game seven hangover. I thought Dallas would come in guns blazing. Uh, I was right. I think they'll win game two. I don't think it'll be a blowout. I don't know that there will be any blowouts in this series. I just like, uh, it was weird that there were in the Dallas, or excuse me, the Denver series. I mean, uh, Dallas OKC, there was only one game with a, a double digit, actually two games with a double digit margin. Game one, that Dallas lost by 22, and game five, where they beat OKC in OKC by 12. Um, the rest of them were all relatively close. The Clippers series was a little bit different. Uh, there were some blowouts in that series. Uh, both directions, mostly Dallas blowing out LA. I don't know that, you know, we get more than one of those in this series. I think it's a six or seven game series. I picked Wolves in six. I'll stick with it. Um, and I think this is another close game, but I think the Wolves execute. I think they focus. Um, I Maybe it's a two possession game. I'll take, you know, uh, I don't know, Wolves by five, Wolves by six, something like that, I think is is what my pick would be. Uh, real quick, the fan to align on this one is Minnesota by five and a half, which is, a bigger spread than I would have expected. I thought it'd be in the four, four and a half range again. I think it was four before the game, four game one. What did I say? I just said five or six. So I'd be right around there. I don't know that I would take, uh, I don't know that I would take the uh, the spread with Minnesota. I might just go money line with that. Um, or if you can, if you can get it a little bit higher, but on FanDuel, it's minus five and a half. Uh, I think the Wolves win. I, I said that before I even looked at the line. <laughs> I think it'll be five or six points. The Wolves win by it. Um, so I agree with that line at FanDuel. Now, the line was off a ton in Minnesota-Denver, so who knows. But that's my take. Um, Sunday, I don't know. Uh, my, I think, obviously, it depends a little bit on what happens Friday night. If the Wolves win a relatively close game, um, Sunday could go either way, and then I would pick the opposite result on Tuesday. I, I said all along I didn't know what order this would happen in, but I thought Wolves-Dallas would split both games in Minnesota and both games in Dallas. And then I think Minnesota wins game five on their home floor and closes it out game six in Dallas. Um, that's still my prediction. I think uh, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, the Wolves have certainly played worse games than game one of the series, but the some of the stuff that they were sloppy on are things that are easily fixable and we've seen them fixed before and they still only lost by three points. I keep going back to that. Um, I still think this matchup is fine for Minnesota. I'm not as doom and gloom about that as some folks. Um, and I think they'll end up winning the series, and, and I'll, I'll take them in six still. All right. A reminder, we have a live postcast on Lockdown Sports Minnesota on YouTube immediately following the game, so check that out tonight. If you can't catch it live, you can find the audio right here. The next episode on this audio feed, Lockdown Wolves, will be the postcast with Tyler Metcalf and Luke Inman. So check that out late tonight or on Saturday. And uh, Sunday night, same deal. Postcast Sunday night following game three in Dallas. Wolves, Mavs, and then I will have the post game pod following Sunday's game. It will be early Monday that will post uh, Monday Memorial Day. We'll still have an episode for you following that game on Sunday night. So big weekend ahead, and uh, we'll uh, we'll know a lot more about this series on Monday. Hopefully, we're looking at a two one Wolves lead, um, or at the very least, uh, you know, at the very least the Wolves have to split these two games. That goes without saying. So we'll we'll talk about all that on Monday. A uh, big thank you for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every single day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere. That includes YouTube as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. Wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find Lockdown Wolves. You can also watch on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app on both Roku and Amazon Fire TV. And you can follow on X at Lockdown T Wolves and also at B Beacon with two B's, two E's, C K E N. A reminder that Lockdown has launched the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel on YouTube, and it's now available on the Amazon Fire TV app in the free Fire TV channels app. Lockdown Sports Today is here for you 24 7. Covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Lockdown Plus, our national shows covering every league. Find Lockdown Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. Of course, the Lockdown Wolves podcast is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Remember, the Lockdown Network is your local experts on all the biggest stories. Once again, I'm Ben Beacon. This is the Lockdown Wolves podcast, and we'll catch you next time.